one of the things that was going on since Molina was interested in this whole concept too uh, and they were trying to find well where can we get some money to do something with all of this uh, they went back to Theodore von Karman who had connections and von Karman was a member of a committee in 1940 that uh, National Science Foundation that uh, was looking at various, anticipating, I suppose, various wartime needs. Uh, they knew the war would come eventually to the United States, uh, so what can we do to prepare for it? And von Karman was at a meeting back east uh, with a man from MIT by the name of Jerome Hunsaker, where they were talking about various um, research projects. And uh, there were two of them on the docket that they came up and that, they, that these two men were considering that had quite a bit of money associated with it, $10,000, compared to the hundreds of dollars it had at, in, at uh, Pasadena, that's quite a bit. Um, the two projects included working on aircraft window de-icing at high altitudes, and working on a thing called jet-assisted takeoffs. Uh, that is, trying to develop some way to make it so airplanes, using a solid fuel rocket, or maybe a liquid fuel rocket, who knows, we'll have to find out, um, to be able to use a runway that was much, much shorter or possibly take off from the uh, deck of an aircraft carrier. Uh, because the runways were too long, if you're going to build runways in a wartime setting, you're going to have to build as short as possible. Uh, you can get a plane to, to uh, land in a lot shorter space than you can take it, have to have it the length that you have to have to take it off. So. They looked at the projects. Hunsaker says to von Karman, you, I'll take the window de-icing task, and you take the Buck Rogers job. And what this was was the disdain that Hunsaker had for the whole idea that Buck Rogers projects would ever work out to mean anything. Von Karman says, OK, fine. I've got some graduate students and a couple of other guys that would be interested in doing this. So von Karman came home with $10,000 and said, what we're going to do is find a small airplane. In fact, it turned out to, a, to be an airplane called the Air Coupe, uh, which was so small, uh, it was hard to stall. It was a one-man, one, uh, open cockpit type of aircraft, but it was a modern airframe. Uh, but it weighed under 1,000 pounds, uh, even when the pilot was inside it. Uh, and he said, OK, we'll try to build some sort of a motor that we can use with that aircraft that will get it off the ground in a shorter distance. In August of 1941, uh, the war still hasn't started. Uh, von Karman, Parsons, Foreman, Molina, and a whole bunch of other people who are now coming, kind of coming together. Another roommate of, of uh, Molina's uh, here at Caltech, a fellow by the name of Martin Summerfield, gets involved. Um, uh, a, a very brilliant Chinese uh, graduate student, uh, a fellow by the name of Wei Xu Tian, uh, gets involved. And uh, with Parsons, and Parsons gets some other people working with him who know other aspects of solid motors. Uh, the Miller brothers, Fred and Clyde Miller, come to work with him. And they get together and using Lee Page's glue, uh, pack into uh, a heavy metal cylinder, ammonium perchlorate. By chance, uh, this came to the archives only this last January, here is a real motor. It's not very big. Uh, it's basically made out of metal pipe, very heavy, believe me. Uh, it's got a nice pap pipe cap that's been screwed onto one end. And on this end, there's a tiny nozzle. This is, this is the, the, the active end of all of this. Uh, the nozzle has been hooked onto this. And, a, and this tube then, with this assemblage taken off, would have been packed with this ammonium perchlorate and uh, a substance, glue and other stuff, to make it so that it would adhere and stay tight to the sides of the chamber. And then across the end of that, there was put a little piece of nichrome wire, and then an electrical connection was made to the spark plug. Hey, they knew spark plugs, they knew how to get that to work. And you would put electricity through this, throw a switch, heat the wire, set the charge on fire, it would burn down this way and the nozzle and the power would come out of here. Okay, how much thrust? Here it is, how much thrust? 12 pounds per unit. That isn't much. That's almost as much as this weighs. However, 
it was enough if you took and mounted 12 under each wing, 24 total of these, on the air coop, that it could reduce the takeoff uh, distance by about a third over what the air coop otherwise needed. And these tests were carried out in August of 1941, and out of it, the, the tests were so encouraging to Parsons, Foreman, Molina, Von Karman, uh, and Summerfield that they said, you know what we should do? We should form a company to build these. And in uh, March of 1942, they get together along with uh, Andrew Haley, who was Von Karman's attorney, uh, who put up most of the money to come to find out about it, and form the Aerojet Engineering Corporation, which was, what was it going to do? The war had now started, and they were going to build JATO units under contract for the Navy. The Navy had great use of that. If they're going to have uh, needs for, for getting off of aircraft carriers, if they're going to be involved in any landing activities, these kind of things will work. And they did. They built ones that were successful. But they had a problem. <laughs> the problem was that the, if the temperature ex got too extreme where these were stored, the material separated from the walls, and instead of being cigarette burning, the burning went down the sides, the pressure built up, and the thing exploded. Well, this isn't very safe. You're flying your airplane, you're getting ready to take off, and you set off your JTOs, and instead your wings get blown off. And then maybe, you know, you get hurt. So, they knew they were having, they were, knew they were having no predictability of these uh, motors working exactly the way it had been designed. And by this time, Parsons and Foreman had left the uh, relationship they had with Caltech and had gone over to work for this new organization, uh, gone to work for Aerojet. And Parsons was given the title of Chief uh, Solid Fuel uh, Designer. And he was then set up in a situation where we have the contract, they want JATOs of this kind, and they're not working. Jack, solve the problem. Well, it's at this point that Parsons makes a leap of insight that is basically revolutionary. No one had thought of this before. No one had seen this. Uh, and Parsons knew explosives. Parsons knew the mechanical problems he was having with motors. And as the story has it, he and Clyde Miller, or Fred Miller, one of the Miller brothers, are wa out walking one day, and they come across a place here in Pasadena where the roof is being repaired, and there is a tar truck, uh, asphalt's being used, put up on the roof, and Parsons has this great uh, uh, insight uh, into solving the problem that he's faced with. This occurs sometime maybe in June of 1942. No first-hand accounts. Parsons never told the story himself. It's all apocryphal. But apparently this is about what happened. He says to himself, I could substitute asphalt and maybe some oil to mix it uh, for the binder that would be needed for ammonium perchlorate. And instead of having to scram this down by hydraulic pressure into these, this metal tube, I could maybe pour it in because I could melt it. Uh, if I don't heat it too hot, it won't explode. I can have a controlled heating, maybe 160, 180 degrees. The asphalt will be liquid. I can mix the ammonium chloride in with it. I can pour it into that tube that I've got ready, and it will adhere to the walls and solve my problem. Ta-da, it did.